Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this forum discussing the New Orleans experience with the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. This uh, forum is um, It's part of uh, a larger discussion of the effects of COVID-19 uh, that will continue on uh, Monday, May 4th at 10 a.m. in the Tulane Innovation section on COVID-19's health disparities and public impacts. Uh, we aren't able at any one point to discuss everything that's involved and I think it's important to look at these other um, presentations uh, around uh, the effect and impact of COVID-19. This is a, a forum that will be presented with uh, Dr. Uh, Walter Isaacson, uh, Dean Leviste, uh, Thomas Leviste, and uh, Professor Susan Hasek. I am uh, Dr. Ronald Blanton, Chair of the Department of Tropical Medicine at the Tulane School of uh, Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And it's no great surprise that like uh, most of the country, Louisiana, and especially New Orleans, has experienced a trauma unheard of uh, thus far in the 21st century. Uh, we have had an uncontrolled epidemic of a highly uh, transmissible and relatively lethal uh, virus that has fundamentally changed the way that we are going to live in the near future as well as in the more distant future. Uh, right now, the epidemic is not over. It continues. Uh, but we have what looks like a little breathing spell to sort of uh, look back and ask what just happened? Uh, how did we respond? How is it to live in New Orleans uh, during this uh, crisis? Um, this uh, forum uh, will be given by the voices that come directly from uh, New Orleans, the people that have been here and have lived this experience, which includes myself, uh, Dr. David Musha, uh, the uh, the uh, chair of uh, the chief of the section of infectious disease at Tulane uh, School of Medicine, Juan Duchesne, uh, the uh, chief of uh, trauma and uh, director of the uh, ICU at uh, Tulane uh, School of Medicine, um, Dr. Uh, Giovanni uh, Pierre de Monte, who is uh, the uh, vice uh, dean of research at Tulane, uh, with uh, Christy. Uh, um, Bardell, who is the managing director of the Louisiana Public Health Institute. Uh, and uh, to wrap things up, we have uh, the uh, Dean of the School of uh, Medicine at Tulane, uh, Dr. Lee Ham, and uh, the Associate Dean of uh, Faculty and Development at the School of uh, Public Health and Tropical Medicine, uh, Patricia, Mark, uh, Patricia Kissinger. To begin at the beginning, New Orleans, New Orleans, uh, in most parts of the world, this evokes the image uh, of uh, Mardi Gras almost everywhere you go. Uh, it's the uh, iconic celebration uh, that happens in this city uh, almost, uh, well, every year, almost at the same time of year, in which we invite about a million of our, our closest friends to rub shoulders and nowadays in COVID to rub elbows uh, with the citizenry as well as with each other. Uh, it's a time uh, with uh, a lot of parties, uh, some of which are, are real bacchanalia. But for the most part, to tell you the truth, most of the entertainment is so tame you could take your grandmother or your two-year-old to see almost any event that happens during Mardi Gras time. The public health officials as well do not hesitate, have never hesitated to pull the plug on festivities anytime they thought there was a threat to uh, public safety. However, if we look at the timing of Mardi Gras, what we find is that it occurred at a time very close to the time we were seeing our first episodes uh, of uh, COVID-19. Uh, Mardi Gras really takes place after the, the 6th of January epiphany. Uh, and there are celebrations that occur all the way through to Fat Tuesday, the last day of Mardi Gras before Lent on February 25th this year. Uh, five days later, on the, the, or eight days later on the 5th of March, uh, one of our citizens complained of symptoms. And uh, four days after that, on March 9th, the first case of COVID-19 uh, was diagnosed in this city. Um, while public health officials were trying to figure out exactly what to do with that over the next week, 
uh, we identified 100 cases and two deaths. And at that point, the mayor uh, uh, issued a stay-at-home order. Uh, and that was soon followed by the governor issuing a stay-at-home order for the entire state. As expected, there was a rapid increase in the number of cases up until about a peak in April 2nd, in which we had over 700 cases, new cases, and 310 deaths. Uh, after that, uh, there was a rapid decline in the number of cases that we see to the point that now for the last two weeks, we've had less than a 1% increase per day, more on the order of 25, maybe 40 patients, new patients a day. Uh, in total, as of yesterday, there were 6,365 cases just in this parish and uh, 406 deaths. Certainly, it looks very suspicious, the relationship between Mardi Gras and the first case So I have written, and I'll tell you now, that New Orleans does not need Mardi Gras in order to have an epidemic. That this city has been able to dispatch its citizens with some efficiency ever since its founding. In the 1700s through to the beginning of the 20th century, there have been waves of epidemics that have killed up to 10% of the population at a time. And when yellow fever left town, Cholera came in. We had cholera many uh, uh, years in the, eight, in the 19th century, and even a transmission in 1986 when there were 10 cases in New Orleans and around the area of New Orleans. And I don't know of any other state that actually had uh, active transmission. Uh, malaria was a problem until it was controlled in uh, the 1950s. And this is the past, but even now, what we'll see is that we have epidemics of West Nile. Last year was a West Nile year for um, uh, New Orleans, uh, that uh, the state of Louisiana and New Orleans have uh, HIV rates that are above the national average, and that uh, congenital syphilis, shameless, uh, shamefully, uh, we were number one in the country up until 2016, and we're still near the top of the list uh, for this disease that really shouldn't even exist. Finally, there we also have leptospirosis, and it doesn't seem like many cases, only 10 cases or less a year. But I don't know of another state that has 10 cases of leptospirosis almost every year. So why New Orleans and why now? Well, first of all, uh, Orleans uh, Parish and Jefferson Parish are the population centers for the state. So that Things that happen to people happen more commonly here because we have more people around this part of the country, this part of the state. In addition, uh, contagion is not just a linear relationship between population size, it also has to do with the density. Person to person spread occurs more easily where populations are more dense. And the density of Orleans uh, Parish is 2.5 times greater than other parishes, uh, the general parish in Louisiana, and three times greater than uh, the density of housing units. Um, New Orleans is an international seaport and it takes only about two flights to get from New Orleans to anywhere in the world and back. This is a, a tourist destination and a destination for cruise ships uh, that uh, if there is a disease that affects African-Americans as COVID seems to do, out of proportion to the rest of the American population, Louisiana is 30% African-American, but New Orleans, Louisiana is 60% African-American. The other things that we find as uh, risk factors for this uh, are uh, those comorbidities of diabetes, hypertension, uh, and obesity. Uh, and for those, if we look at how New Orleans, or at least uh, the state of Louisiana ranks, it all ranks at the bottom. We are 47th uh, in the numbers of cases of diabetes. We are 45th for high blood pressure. We are 47th for obesity. Infection disease in general, we are ranked 48th. And in clinical care, we also rank 48th. Uh, we are not uh, stupid, nor are we uh, complacent in that, uh, to our credit, we are ranked number 28 uh, in childhood immunization. And these are data from the CDC that were uh, compiled by the United Health Foundation. The climate, uh, it's not known yet uh, what climate effects have on COVID-19, although it seems to do pretty well in the cold, as well as pretty well in the heat. But climate has an effect here in New Orleans in that the climate is so nice that people are outside most of the year. Uh, people don't huddle inside like they do places where there's a lot of snow and ice. 
And in addition to that, there is a warm street culture. There are thousands of bistros and bars and small restaurants throughout the city in places where tourists rarely go uh, that have to be supported by the population itself. This is a culture that tends to be in the street meeting each other so that social distancing doesn't come naturally to people in New Orleans. When we talk about hypotheses uh, that uh, Mardi Gras caused COVID-19 or made COVID-19 worse, uh, most of the time when we look at hypotheses, one of the ways we support it or at least uh, uh, deny it is to look at examples or counterexamples. And there's no lack of counterexamples for Mardi Gras. Seattle, New York, Detroit, Chicago, the Navajo Nation, none of these places needed Mardi Gras in order to have a very rip-roaring epidemic in their locations. We can look on the flip side as well. The example would be Brazil. Brazil is a place that had had four Mardi Gras, just as big as the one that occurs in New Orleans, each with a million visitors from within South America as well as from with Europe, within Europe. One of the major uh, venues for Mardi Gras or, or Carnival in Brazil is Salvador. All of these, of course, occur at the same time as Mardi Gras. Uh, this is one of the three um, uh, carnival uh, routes, parade routes, within the city of Salvador. And this is not an uncommon site. Uh, on uh, the right is Rio, the San Bodromo, uh, in which uh, there again are large crowds of people. Then this does not show the amount of uh, street parades that go on nowadays in Rio as well. But if we look at the effect of COVID-19 uh, in these places, Brazil is having an epidemic of COVID-19, and Brazil has a problem with COVID-19, but it pales besides what's happened in this country and in this state. We looked at uh, the whole state of Bahia, in which Salvador resides, a city of 3 million people. They've had uh, about 2,800 cases and 104 deaths, nothing like we see just in the city of New Orleans. We look at uh, Rio. Rio has had 9,000 cases and 854 deaths. Once again, this is large, but it still pales beside what we see in the state of Louisiana and throughout the United States. And they had a large Mardi Gras. So New Orleans does not need Mardi Gras to have an epidemic. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not a Mardi Gras denier. It is entirely possible that Mardi Gras contributed or even introduced COVID-19 here. But when you consider, excuse me, when, when you consider that uh, the, the size of the city, uh, the, the, the openness of the culture and the population, uh, its relationship to international travel and international commerce, uh, and combine that with uh, uh, an epidemic that broke out uh, at just the right time uh, for Mardi Gras in Europe, uh, that uh, uh, is transmitted relatively silently, there is no doubt that COVID-19 was coming to New Orleans in a big way. At some point, it happened to be near Mardi Gras. That may be the relationship for that. What I don't think is uh, actually valid is a simplistic relationship between Mardi Gras equals uh, COVID-19. I think it plays into also a simplistic impulse that uh, most of us in humanity have uh, to say that uh, you need to pay for having just too much fun. I will say again that New Orleans doesn't need Mardi Gras to have an epidemic. What New Orleans does need, however, is a healthcare system that is going to be able to provide for all of its citizens, that leads for the equality of access uh, to healthcare for all of its citizens. I think uh, it needs to be prepared for things like uh, uh, COVID-19, better prepared. Uh, we will see now what the response uh, as an emergency has been. But what we hope to see is what uh, uh, New Orleans will do for its citizens in the future, all year long. David? All right, uh, you ready for me, Dr. Glenn? I am. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna do a little, um, update here on the clinical aspects, both the national scene as well as what's happening locally. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Um, okay. So 
Um, some things haven't changed, and of course, uh, th those are the incubation period, which ranges from two to 14 days, or the median of about five to seven days. That's still pretty much the case. Um, now, initially, um, COVID-19 had been recognized as primarily a respiratory disease, so we were looking for fever, cough, or shortness of breath, but as the epidemic has unfolded, we have certainly recognized that it's much more of a viral flu-like illness with many other features, commonly myalgias, which are muscle pains, sometimes sore throat and headache, but in addition, um, in, in, you know, last month, we started to see more people with GI symptoms, such as abdominal pain, nausea, vomit, vomiting, and diarrhea. And then this peculiar tendency for people to have a reduced or, or loss, uh, loss in um, smell and taste, which is rather unusual. It can occur with other viral illnesses, but it's, it's fairly unusual. So, um, you know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a broad spectrum of different symptoms that we need to be looking for. So this is my favorite um, um, basically chart uh, from Siddiqui from the Brigham. This is about probably four or five, six weeks ago. Um, and it's the first attempt to try to make sense of COVID-19 as a disease in terms of pathogenesis. Um, there's obviously gonna have to be tweaking because it is a model, so it's very crude, but it, there will be tweaking. But it basically gives you the general parameters of this disease in terms of the virus and the immune response. And so what basically, the way you think of this COVID is you can think of it in, in sort of two, three different stages. In the early stage, when people have maybe a little cough, maybe mild uh, headache, mild shortness of breath, generally speaking, the viral load is very high at this point. So this is in that first seven, eight days or so. And then as the disease progresses, if it does progress, then you start to see more of the pulmonary phase. That's when people get more shortness of breath, hypoxia, the viral load starts to go down, and this is when the immune system kicks in. If you think about it, antibodies um, generally uh, take you know seven to ten days to kick in, and so that's when the immune system starts to do its 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 job. But unfortunately, in some patients, the immune system um, exerts an excessive response, a so-called hyperinflammatory reaction, and that's the third stage. It doesn't happen in everybody, but in some people, that's what happens, and that is related to their development of adult respiratory distress syndrome, shock, um, and many other complications. So um, if you look below, you can kind of see some of the signs and symptoms. So in early disease, that's when patients um, may just have lymphopenia. As they get to the pulmonary phase, you start to see signs of pneumonia on imaging. And in the third stage, you start to see these very high inflammatory markers, also markers of clotting. Clotting is an important feature of this disease. And down below, um, you know, it's a very rough um, scheme of how the different uh, interventions may work. Certainly, um, if, you, if somebody's on immunosuppression, you want to reduce that. Um, and then you want to try to start antivirals as soon as possible. This is a general rule of thumb for viruses such as influenza. We know that also Tamivir works quite well in the first one or two days. And then after that, um, it has less of a benefit. So beginning antivirals early is probably important. Um, and then the immunomodulators, um, uh, of which we don't have a proven one yet, probably play a role a little bit later, although we haven't ruled out the possibility that they may play a role earlier in terms of pre preventing progression. So I do expect this, um, this uh, chart to be fine-tuned in the coming months. What, is the, what are clues to COVID, just for those who want to know a little bit more about the labs and things? Well, you know, it's every night... Frequently, these patients have very classic um, combination of low lymphocyte count, mild, mildly abnormal liver function, um, and a normal procalcitonin. Procalcitonin tends to go up in bacterial infections, and in this disease, since it's viral, it tends to be low. And then they, they will often have these um, markers of acute inflammation or clotting, so LDH, ferritin, and D-dimer. And then radiographically, as you can see here, um, this CT scan shows a very classic sort of multifocal, multiple densities in the lungs. Many of them are peripheral. These guys right here are what we call ground glass. They kind of look like ground glass. They're kind of hazy as opposed to these denser infiltrates. You can get a mixture. And when you see this, you know, it, it's one of those things where, yeah, that's COVID. Um, but of course, it isn't always going to be COVID. Other things can mimic this. So this is the, one of the original um, pyramids that was 
um, presented uh, by our world today and others, uh, and it really hasn't changed very much in terms of the overall clinical spectrum. Uh, we continue to see um, that about 80 to 85 percent of patients have mild to moderate disease, and 15 to 20 percent have severe, 5 percent critical. It has not changed. It, it does vary from population to population, location to location. Um, this is um, really the largest and probably really the first um, large cohort of, of U.S. patients from New York City. These are hospitalized patients, 5,700, looking at baseline characteristics. And so it should come as no surprise that the number one um, risk factor, or at least baseline characteristic in those hospitalized over 50% is hypertension. We're seeing that in New Orleans. We see it everywhere. Interestingly, HIV was not very common. It was only 0.8%. And um, so, you know, we're, what I'm hoping is that our HIV patients may actually do as well as others and maybe even better because maybe their immune um, dysfunction might actually work to their advantage uh, in terms of not engendering this hyperinflammatory response. There's also some evidence that in vitro, some of the antiretrovirals that they take have activity against this virus although it has not been well established, but it, clinically it's possible that, that their antiviral, antiretrovirals may actually serve a role as, as prophylaxis. But what really jumps out is when you look over at the metabolic disease category, over 40% of these patients were obese, defined by a BMI of greater than equal to 30, and almost 20% were morbidly obese, with about 34% having diabetes. So this comes as no surprise, this has been seen in all cohorts, um, and if anything, it's worse here in the South and in, in, in New Orleans. I see somebody's asking about um, type 1 versus type 2 diabetics. This would be all diabetics. It's probably, uh, you know, it's, it's far and away more uh, type 2s. Type 1s are much less common in the population. And then if you look at the, um, the comorbidities, you can see that 88% of these patients had more than one comorbidity, and the median number was four. So this is not a super healthy population. These patients generally have hypertension and obesity and, di and diabetes and something else. Um, there, there are certainly many exceptions. There are people who um, don't have any risk factors. There are people you know, who are under 50 who die. Um, but the vast majority of these patients, um, as you can see, have these risk factors. And this is a really large cohort, so I think it gives us some good data. Uh, and then, and finally, the other risk factor that continues to be replicated is the association with increasing age. You can see that in people less than 20, it's very rare that they require hospitalization. Death is very rare. But once you start getting up into the uh, 50s and above, you start to see significant rates of hospitalization um, topping 17% in those over 85, and I'm guessing it's probably higher. The mortality also goes up in a similar uh, manner. So what are the complications of COVID-19? Um, there are many. This is a systemic disease, and um, we are, some of these are newer, um, and most of these are seen uh, nationally, internationally, as well as locally. I'll make a few comments about what we're seeing locally. So um, the most, the best known one is probably adult respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. We've seen that since the very beginning. We do, we have seen quite a bit of that here in New Orleans. There have not been any major breakthroughs in the management of this. However, um, some of the um, you know, principles of managing ARDS, such as prone positioning during ventilation, do seem to be beneficial. Um, I think our pulmonologists and critical care specialists have learned some of the nuances of um, oxygenation in terms of maybe not intubating quite as early as we thought and trying to use higher flow oxygen to stave off intubation because intubation is generally associated with worse outcomes. There are a number of drugs out there. There's a number of immunomodulators, anti-IL-6, and other compounds that are being looked at to see if we can prevent ARDS or ameliorate it. Septic shock occurs, which is interesting because we think of that mostly in the context of bacterial sepsis, not so much with viruses, but this virus will certainly do that, and we've seen plenty of it. Myocarditis is, is certainly well recognized. The virus goes everywhere. It goes um, and then not only to the lungs, it goes to the GI tract, giving rise to GI symptoms. It goes to the heart, giving rise to cardiac arrhythmias, and other, it goes elsewhere. Cardiac arrhythmias are definitely being seen. There are quite a few reports of sudden death. 
Um, rates of um, cardiac arrest in communities have gone up. Presumably some, some of these are due to COVID-19. And then let's not also forget that early on in this epidemic, we all drank the Kool-Aid and we're putting just about everybody on hydroxychloroquine, which probably in retrospect was not the best idea. And hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine do have a five or 10% incidence of inducing um, cardiac arrhythmias. And so we may have actually caused some of these uh, problems ourselves. Hypercoagulability is the big hot topic right now. Many, if not most, of these patients are hypercoagulable. That is, they clot more easily. We're see we've seen that here in New Orleans. One of the early observations was that the patients on dialysis were clotting their, their dialysis lines very easily. And what we're finding is that many of them are getting pulmonary emboli, deep venous thrombosis in the legs. They're finding microthrombi in the vasculature. This is probably a, a, an essential part of a pathophysiology and we are struggling with how to manage this. Certainly we're much more aggressive now in giving anticoagulants uh, prophylactically to most of these patients, if not all. And then if they do have uh, confirmation of clotting, then we uh, aggressively anticoagulate them. But you know, our, our ability to prevent clotting is still not perfect. And, and so this is something that we need to understand more of. There is some evidence that the virus um, or that the endothelium of the blood vessels the cells, the endothelial cells have the ACE2 receptors. And so it's very likely that the virus gets into the endothelium, just as other viruses, and causes an endothelial dysfunction with the resulting coagulation or clotting, which uh, causes many of the deaths. Um, just as in New York, we also saw a lot of acute kidney injury. This is due to multiple mechanisms. Um, at CMC, um, we were able to manage, uh, you know, with some challenges, we were able to get everybody dialyzed. My understanding from Dr. Simon and the pathology is that it was more challenging in university. It was hard to keep up with the demand to provide um, um, uh, dialysis for our patients there. And of course, you probably saw lots of stories about how they were running out of dialysis machines in, in, in New York City. So this is um, you know, something that has been a constant challenge. There are uh, reports of uh, large vessel ischemic strokes. Um, especially in younger people, a Mount Sinai group just published on that and in a cohort of people less than 50 where you wouldn't expect to see these. Although in talking to Amy A. Zen, one of our fantastic uh, neurocritical care stroke specialists, she's seen few of any strokes that she can attribute to COVID-19. I'm sure there were a few, but it, it, you know, we, we, well, we always have lots of strokes here uh, due to the other risk factors, namely hypertension, et cetera. And there are also a lot of other neurologic uh, findings that are found uh, occasionally in cephalitis, encephalopathy, or delirium, um, you name it. There's a whole host of things. We've all seen it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very much a, a multi-system disease, um, which, of course, makes it very challenging because any one of these requires a lot more research and um, experience in managing. So let's talk about treatment now. There have been some updates. So the disappointing news has been that hydroxychloroquine has fallen out of favor, uh, generally speaking, for the treatment of this disease. There was a lot of excitement a month ago about hydroxychloroquine in combination with azithromycin. Uh, but of course, the study um, that much of that was based on was um, somewhat flawed. And so it really is falling out of favor. However, there still may be a role for this agent in uh, post-exposure prophylaxis um, in healthcare workers and families of patients, in pre-exposure prophylaxis of healthcare workers and patients, and also perhaps still in very, very early disease. Because you know, as a general rule, a weaker drug, a weaker antiviral, is more likely to be of some prophylactic benefit than it is to be of benefit later in disease. And we at Tulane have at least two studies, the University of Washington, uh, collaboration looking at both um, PEP and early disease with Patty Kissinger, Al Luke, and others. The big news this week and the bright spot was the early um, press releases about remdesivir, the Gilead nucleotide antiviral, for which there was some evidence of benefit and compassionate use. And then on the 29th, um, Gilead uh, issued a news release of a study that we were a part of here at Tulane that was comparing five days of this drug versus 10 days in patients with severe disease. And while there was no control group, no comparator, um, the good news was that five days seemed to be just as good as 10 days. So what that means is that we may be able to get by with half as many days of treatment, which 
frees up more drug for more patients, perhaps reduces toxicity. Um, in terms of efficacy, you couldn't say very much because there's no comparator. However, um, a day or two ago, I guess yesterday, um, Tony Fauci and others um, announced um, the, um, some data that had been released to the Independent Data and Safety Monitoring Board that was monitoring the NIAD randomized trial with, with the Arezzo placebo controlled arm. And in this, uh, in this uh, study, they found a 31% reduction in time to recovery, which is 15, uh, 11 days to recovery instead of 15. It doesn't sound like much, but that's actually pretty good for a viral illness. When you think that oseltamivir or Tamiflu reduces the duration of flu by about a day. So this is somewhat promising. However, um, this, this data has not really been subjected to thorough peer review. It has not been published. We have not seen all the data. It may not be based on the entire cohort because there are obviously still patients in the hospital that are being followed. And so, you know, some people are disappointed. Some people say 31% isn't very good, um, but I, I just don't think we know at this point exactly how effective. I think also it will be very interesting to figure out how it works at different stages. It may be that remdesivir works even better when it's given even earlier and not as well when it's given later. That will all have to be teased out. And there are ongoing studies still of remdesivir um, in moderate disease. My understanding is that the FDA is in discussion with Gilead and there's a possibility of FDA approval sometime next week, which is extraordinarily fast. Uh, but then the rate limiting step, of course, will be Gilead's ability to manufacture the drug. They're, they're in, certainly in the clinical trial phase where they don't need as many um, units of drug and it's gonna take a while to ramp up production. But we'll see a paradigm shift now as more and more patients who come and will start to get this as the standard of care. And new studies will have to incorporate that because it won't be ethical to not give somebody remdesivir um, for the most part in, in, in uh, new studies. So more to be heard about this. Again, it's an IV drug, so it's not very practical for outpatients, and that's still a big gap in our armamentarium. Um, NIL-6 is a target uh, against which cerilumab, um, an FDA-approved drug for other conditions, is being looked at. We are part of the so of the studies, unfortunately, um, last week, the data did not show any benefit for severe disease, but the study is ongoing for critical disease. Here in New Orleans at Tulane uh, University and other hospitals, we have transfused quite a few patients with COVID um, with convalescent plasma, that is plasma derived from uh, recovered COVID um, uh, patients. Um, they have higher titer, they have high titers of antibody and um, it, you know, it was decades and decades of experience doing this with some evidence of benefit. And this, uh, anecdotally, this seems to sometimes work. But again, uh, we, we need to see the data. And then finally, um, you know, over the next few months, there are a number of com companies that are developing monoclonal antibodies, which I think are very hopeful because they can be um, synthesized or made much faster than a vaccine. And these will be more specific. Uh, for the uh, spike protein and other targets in the virus. So I, I'm very you know, hopeful, um, but obviously they also will, they, there will be an issue in terms of ramping up production and costs will be quite high for these, these drugs. So a couple of uh, questions that Dr. Bland asked me to address, particularly from the local viewpoint, has there been enough PPE? Well, yes and no. Um, in talking to um, people at our local hospitals, I don't think we've ever completely run out of PPE the way it may have in some other parts of the country, but we've gotten very low. We've, we've done okay because of su significant restrictions on use. So, you know, in the last month when I've gone up on the COVID wards, nurses have been using gowns for the entire, same gown for the entire day. Many people using the same N95 mask. Um, there is still a shortage nationally of gowns, more so than the masks. That's been going on for weeks. Um, I would like to give a shout out to our wonderful Tulane medical students who have designed a very quick, um, quickly made, uh, homemade um, gown made out of um, 55 gallon garbage bags. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's cheap. It's like a dollar a gown. You can make them in 10 minutes. They have been making them and supplying for our local hospitals and they have a very nice YouTube video that shows people how to make them and how to deploy them, how to put them on, how to take them off. Um, University Medical Center, I believe, has been using some ultraviolet um, decontamination of masks to, um, to um, get more mileage out of the masks. Um, Tulane Medical Center um, has been participating in the Tulane Primate Center's 
um, hydrogen peroxide vapor decontamination protocol. Um, that um, unfortunately, it's been uh, it's been a drown out drawn out process because the FDA insisted on reviewing the primate center's protocol. And so I don't know if we, I, when I spoke to Angie Birnbaum, the biosafety director who's um, championed all this as of a few days ago, we were very close to getting FDA approval. And there were a batch of 700 masks that were being ready to deliver to Tulane Hospital. In addition, this corporation called Battelle, which has already done this kind of work, um, had, uh, has offered to process masks for hospitals in New Orleans. And I understand that they have a batch of masks from Tulane that we're hopeful we'll be getting uh, back soon. Um, so we do have, you know, and we will be better prepared the next time around uh, in terms of having these modalities. Next question is, what is testing like in New Orleans? Who's testing how and the numbers? So just to give you the overall, this is data from a few days ago. Um, overall, the state had done over 20,000 commercial tests, um, about 1,800 tests done by the State Office of Public Health for a total of about 22,000 tests. Uh, when you consider that at, uh, on that day, there were 6,380 confirmed tests, that gives us a percent positivity of 29%. Um, and um, the view, that's, that's actually for New Orleans, I'm sorry, um, New Orleans. For the state, the percent positivity is 18%, it's lower. Now, the question then is, you know, how much, how much testing is adequate? That's a tricky question. But one of the benchmarks that the WHO and others have used is that if, you, if you're testing, your positivity rate gets down below 10%, as has been achieved in some countries overseas, then you're probably doing a pretty good job of re reaching your population. So we still have a ways to go if we're going to get from 29% of New Orleans Parish to less than 10%. Um, there is a living document that I can send you that gives you the daily update uh, of the um, test centers in New Orleans. Um, there is the mobile center that's a joint initiative between LCMC, um, I think the city, and uh, LSUHSC. Um, they were at Xavier a week or two ago. I believe they may be in Marrero right now. They're going to move around the state. Um, there are other test sites at various hospitals. Um, you know, at the School of Medicine, we have a test site for um, not only doing uh, healthcare workers, but also for uh, the New Orleans first responders, fire, state police, um, police, um, EMS, uh, et cetera. So there, there are, you know, it, it's probably not enough. And I do hope that one outcome of uh, Governor Bell Edwards meeting with President Trump a few days ago is that we will get hundreds of thousands of more tests. But, you know, the tricky part is getting it deployed and getting it out into the neighborhoods. I think there is a lot of Jennifer Avegno and others with the city, people from the state are looking at ways of bringing testing to the people in our neighborhoods. We need more of that. Uh, and then finally, also, how have uh, healthcare workers been stressed? Have there been salary cuts? Well, so at Tulane Hospital, what they've done is that in, in the AORs were closed. They have flexed some of those people to other areas, to outpatient and inpatient areas. They have let go most of their contract workers. Um, you know, some of the staff have been sent home at a 70% salary reduction. Um, not that anybody really cares, but if you, you know, listen to the Louisiana State Medical Society, you'll find out that there are many struggling physicians in private practice because they don't work for a big company. Um, they're not salaried. They get paid uh, based on how much they bill for the work they do, and they've had a drastic reduction in outpatient visits. It's been slow to get telemedicine up and going. It's cumbersome. Um, it doesn't, you know, not private insurers don't always have, don't always uh, reimburse for it. It's very, it can be very arbitrary. So there, you know, there are physicians out there that are struggling. We've been fortunate at Tulane that Tulane has supported us uh, throughout this. Uh, in many ways, you want you, you, know, you want to keep your team together because we this this too shall pass. And and before we know, we'll be back and we'll be busy. We are starting to ramp up uh, time sensitive surgeries at Tulane clinics are going to start to ramp up this month. So we will need people on board. But there have definitely been many financial stressors on the healthcare workers. Um, what has been the coordination between institutions, city, and state? There are many examples. I was very proud of the fact that Tulane Hospital partnered with the University Medical Center. Uh, initially, when we rolled out the Roche PCR testing platform, the contract specified that half the tests were done for Tulane and half were done for the University Medical Center. And I will say that UMC was very helpful in obtaining some of the reagents that Tulane needed for that uh, test. The School of Medicine has 
continues to have the drive-through testing that's not only for Tulane personnel, but also for local first responders. Um, the ID people have had a weekly Zoom call to discuss treatment protocols, and that's involved not only Tulane and UMC, but Turo and Oxner and others. Um, we have certainly collaborated with the Convention Center. John Carlson of Tulane faculty is the medical director there, and they have also helped us tremendously by offloading some of the patients who don't need to be in a hospital setting but need to be somewhere to get some care where they can get some, a few liters of oxygen and some care. And so that, that's been also a tremendous benefit. And there are many other examples of collaboration between uh, people in this area. What is the mortality overall and what is the mortality of venting patients? So a couple of days ago, I did a little, uh, you know, uh, back of the pants uh, calculations here. So the case fatality rates, remember case fatality rates mean the number of deaths divided by the number of known cases. That's distinguished from what's probably more important, the infection mortality rate, which is the true mortality rate based on the total number of people that actually became infected. And you can see that in Orleans Parish, it was about 6.4%, Jefferson a little bit lower at 5.5%. St. John the Baptist was higher, but of course that's in part due to the fact that they had an outbreak in, in a, um, it was a facility there. St. Tammany was on the high side at 8.8%. But what we really need to know is what is the true infection mortality rate? That is, what, it, what are your chances of dying if you get the infection, regardless of whether or not you are sick enough to come in and get tested? So the IFR, infection mortality rate, is, is almost certainly going to be lower than the case fatality rate. And as some people estimate, it's probably at least 10, 15, maybe 20 times as many people out there who have been infected than we know about. And so what that means is the infection mortality rate will be roughly one-tenth. So we may end up somewhere in the 0.5% ballpark, but that's still five times as many people as die annually from influenza, so that's still not trivial. I was also asked to look at case fatality on ventilated patients, and that data is still not quite available. Um, they, we don't have enough data um, to really accurately say that. I will say that you know it's generally been quite high in some places around the country. It's been 70, 80, 90%. I do think that as during the epidemic, we got better at managing these patients. I note that for a while there, University Medical Center had a reputation for getting more patients extubated than anywhere else in the area. And people were literally going over there and trying to figure out what it was they were doing that was uh, giving them that success. And I'm not sure if we know for sure, um, there could be differences in populations in terms of age and things like that. Um, but bottom line is, I, I think we have gotten a little bit better at the supportive care and now hopefully with um, new antivirals on the horizon, we can get those rates uh, down a little bit more. So thanks to all the brave clinicians, nurses, staff, researchers, students, and volunteers who are working so tirelessly and will continue to work to, to defeat this pandemic. Thank you very much. All right, hello, can everybody see me? Yes, we're ready to start. So um, Juan Duches, I'm the Division Chief of Trauma for Tulane and um, uh, Dr. Ron asked me to give a little bit of perspective of how our ICU, the trauma ICU at University Medical Center was actually transformed into a COVID ICU. So uh, that's what I'm gonna be talking about in the next uh, few slides. And just a quick disclosure. Uh, I am not an infectious disease doctor. I do trauma. I do, I'll do love resuscitation. I teach uh, trauma resuscitation to the Navy SEALs medics and uh, my passion is into doing trauma and resuscitation. Uh, but obviously as a director of our ICU in the University Medical Center, we were basically confronted with uh, the reality of adapting to take care of uh, COVID patients. So uh, just uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be telling you a little bit story about how we adapted and what things we did during this time in order to contribute to take care of these patients at the University Medical Center. 
So I remember on March 9, uh, I was driving my kids to school like any other parents in the morning. Uh, we were having our talk. And I received a call from uh, the director of the MICU at university telling me, hey, we need to talk. Let's just have a little conference so we can start discussing how we're going to deal with these COVID patients. So, of course, I said, yeah, no problem. Let's do that. Uh, and it was a very productive, easy meeting, good meeting. And uh, basically, after that uh, meeting, uh, right after that meeting, we uh, had our first patient. It was a surprise. We were in shock that actually this was happening so fast in front of our face. Uh, so we were not really that prepared to begin with uh, on, on the e basic issues of taking care of these patients. So that, that same day at night, uh, Governor Edwards put the announcement that actually we have our first patient in the Orlean Parish. And back then we were not that sure about how easy this was uh, transmittable from person to person. So uh, this is uh, coming directly from the statement of our governor, Dr. Edwards. Uh, so uh, during that time, we started just taking care of a lot of patients in the ICU, in the medical ICU. So I was working side to side with our director of the MICU just to see what things I could be of any help. And uh, on March 14, uh, that's when we had a little bit of sense of urgency because patients were coming fast and furious. And a lot of these patients, they presented in, in very extreme, extreme uh, conditions and they deteriorated quite fast. So we had a sense of urgency. And at that point, I talked to my trauma medical director, Dr. John Hunt, and we said, listen, we need to triage and we need to change the way we're taking call of our trauma patients. So we changed from having 11 trauma surgeons available during the whole month to only three surgeons available per week. So that was a big change. And we did that in order to preserve our trauma surgeons, just in case that something, uh, a, a bigger need of uh, critical care physicians was needed later on. Because of the amount of volume of patients that we had coming in fast and furious, we decided to do our own algorithm. This is the first sketch live. Uh, that we had uh, in the MICU. And uh, we basically talk about when to prone, fluid management, uh, ventilatory management, and sedation. From this, that same day, we put it into a little uh, nice format. And by the end of that day, we had actually a good uh, UMC approved format of what to do with this patient. So there was a little bit of progress finally going on in the right direction and taking care of these patients when they arrived to the ICU. March 20, I was introduced to uh, prognostic models, uh, artificial intelligence, and this is by the end of my first week of dealing with COVID patients. And everybody's familiar with the IHME website, where basically this is the first website, to my knowledge, uh, that actually describe uh, some of the basic things about the government mandated social distancing. Uh, they cover as well the peak mortality, when was gonna be expected, and this was a big eye opener for me because uh, I was not even aware that such technology was available. And uh, it all, and it basically tell us as well uh, if, there we, if uh, we're gonna be having problems with resources, meaning beds availability and vent availability. Uh, this uh, meeting happened, uh, this basically I was exposed to this at the end of the week. And then on during the weekend, I had a couple of talks with some of my uh, biostatistics uh, uh, personnel, and we decided to do a meeting uh, on Monday uh, that, to discuss this, because uh, we felt like we can do even better than what we were looking at uh, on this website. And uh, we launched, uh, with the help of the Louisiana Emergency Response Network, um, our own uh, statistical state statistic analysis uh, that was basically in collaboration with LEARN, in collaboration with the Blood Center, and later on, many other people joined uh, to help with data information. Not only we developed this uh, format, we decided to do a red cap um, uh, database, and that was RB approved within a couple of uh, weeks. And uh, right now, we have close to 250 patients, COVID patients, for Region 1 uh, in New Orleans. In March 24, we had, that's when we had our, our reality check. Uh, 
And I say reality check because I received a frantic call from one of my biostatisticians telling me, uh, Dr. Duchesne, you need to take a look at what I just found out. And uh, she basically, what she did was she looked at every single state uh, on how many beds they had available, how many bed charges they were going to have uh, during the peak season of COVID. And as you can tell, as you can see in the top of the screen here, Louisiana, at that point, we were nine days away from the projected uh, peak mortality peak. And not only that, we were basically getting very close to full saturation of our hospitals. So at that point, that was an oh, -oh moment for everybody uh, on, um, on my team because we definitely needed to do something about this. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, on this slide, uh, you could see that the problem was with the distribution of beds. There were a lot of place states that actually were basically rich in ICU beds and they were at an, in excess of a lot of ICU beds. And for that reason, we decided to uh, propose, and hopefully this will be for future pandemics uh, or any kind of uh, uh, events in the future to prepare us better. And uh, we basically develop uh, some kind of an inclusive inter-hospital resource allocation to mitigate this kind of pandemia, where basically we discuss the benefits of having uh, different states sharing resources through a center command, uh, through a critical care command center. So hopefully this will be one of the lessons learned on how we can improve in the future. So on March 25, uh, Dr. Leeham uh, uh, basically set up a great meeting uh, with the team in Seattle. And uh, in, uh, in that meeting, we actually were able to talk to Dr. Martinelli and Laura Evans about a lot of things. But one of the things that was very crucial was the mention of surge capacity and surge capacity plans. So with that information in mind, I talked to my team. I said, listen, we have the numbers. Let's develop uh, uh, the same models in Louisiana. So we went back to the... Uh, to the, basically to the office and we decided to look at prediction models for saturations in ICU. And what we found out is that Oxner was actually, if you look at the day uh, by March 25th, uh, Oxner at that point still looked like we're okay with beds. Then we uh, look at uh, University Medical Center and look like within four days from that day, we were gonna be in major trouble. Four days. Uh, Tulane actually was not looking uh, that bad. That was the next one. They had more, more bed availability. So with that in mind, uh, we had a lot of work to do. And because of that, and because of many other items going on, the at University Medical Center, we had an ICU critical care meeting uh, on March 26. And it was a great uh, high fire. I'm not gonna lie to you, very emotional meeting where a lot of people actually express uh, acceptance, uh, disagreement, but at the end of the day, I think we did the right thing. And I'm gonna discuss very briefly what uh, we did in that meeting. It's a lot of information in these slides here, but I would like you to pay attention on the left side of the screen, the ICU trigger points. What we decided to do was in a stepwise fashion, we decided how we were going to start each unit, populate each unit with COVID patients, what things we were gonna start shutting down. One of the priorities of University Medical Center was not to stop providing care, surgical care, medical care to any patient that came COVID or not COVID patient. So we had a lot in our hands, but with a lot of good thinking and a lot of good planning, I think we were successful to establish uh, the rollover model. So at the beginning, we started with 24 ICU beds. And at the end, with expansion and conversion of the trauma ICU, with a conversion of a new unit on floor four, uh, tower three, and floor four, five, tower three, and the CTRC extended ICU, we were able from 24 beds to expand to a total of 100 beds. And this is how it looked. Uh, basically, the COVID ICU team one was 24 beds. I, uh, trauma ICU 
was a COVID ICU team too with 24 beds and that was staffed by LSU and Tulane surgery. Then the uh, team three or COVID three was 24 more beds of uh, basically LSU. Uh, it was a new LSU ICU team. And then COVID four, which basically we never opened was LSU and Tulane surgery. And the rest of the critical care patients were moved to PACU, were moved to burn unit. And in that way, we were able to keep providing care to our community. So at that point, after that major expansion, that happened within days. Uh, during, after that major expansion, we sit down in the, uh, in the office and we ran some numbers again. And obviously, Oxner was still doing fantastic, no problem with capacity, surge capacity. Tulane Medical Center still doing uh, great. And as you can see now, after that amazing uh, expansion, we were able, we were so close to be hitting zero capacity on March 27, 28, that we were able to basically expand. And, and that was an amazing uh, move by everybody involved in that, uh, that meeting. Uh, and basically the grand total for this, uh, for the state was definitely better. So let me just give you a little bit of uh, how it worked for us in the trauma ICU and at the surgeon's perspective of COVID on taking care of these patients in our unit. We were solely the only providers for these patients from March 23 to April 19, four weeks of which we had two solid weeks of 24 bed capacity, 100% occupancy, and all of the patients at that point, most of them, were intubated and in critical condition. During that time, uh, the outside of the facility, we had the medical triage tents that were basically uh, uh, lifted within two days. The care of the patients, uh, all the medical pumps were outside of the, out of the uh, patient's room, so you can titrate every single patient from outside without going in, in the patient's room. All the orders, everything that was related to DNR status, everything, any communication was written in, this, in the door of the patient. And that way we communicate effectively with the nurses. Rounds were basically done at least four times per day, four times. So we run it in the morning, we run it at three o'clock, we run it at seven and we run it at, uh, before uh, the next day uh, rotation at seven. So everybody had a game plan. It was a very proactive fashion. In the, in, the in the end of this slide on the right side, I don't know if you guys can see those big white pipes. That was a, a reverse isolation floor that was basically uh, improvised within three days. And the institution spent $5 million on this. That's how committed the institution uh, was. So during that time, uh, we had, uh, I'm trying to go back, let me see if I can. Okay, so during that time, uh, all right. I think there's a delay, I apologize for this. All right, so the next slide. So during that time, as you can see, in March 23, we had a total, uh, we had a basically, we started with 23 patients that actually at that point was a lot, but within a couple of hours today to two, day and a half, region, uh, the whole state were basically up to 450 patients. So this basically increased exponentially within days. And the resource allocation for vent management in the green line, you guys can see how that went up fast and fierce as well. We are, our vent capacity uh, was close to 700 and we were at a peak that we were very, getting very close. But I think that good uh, care, which is something that is something that we will definitely need to look at on how we did our vent management. Actually, we had, uh, I believe, better care, better outcomes to the rest of the nation but we still need to look at the numbers. Something I want to emphasize is that we, uh, when we were down in the trenches, we were a little bit in shock of what we were watching in the news because we were not seeing the amount of patients 
uh, we were seeing actually way more patients in our units compared to what we were watching in the news. And as you guys can see on the gray line, that's what we were getting from the state uh, database. The blue line is the USA facts. And actually you guys can see that they were a little bit late in reporting on the COVID patients. And you guys can see on the one on the right side, they were a little bit slow while our peak was way higher than what they were reporting. So uh, that basically in combination with uh, us uh, looking at uh, numbers, uh, I, okay, let's see, this slide. So when you look at our numbers, this is what we were looking at. We divide the state in nine regions and in blue, you can see how, um, how big of a jump within just a day and a half we had in the total amount of COVID patients in region one, which is New Orleans region. And you can see the blue bar going exponentially higher and higher during the time that we were working in our ICU. So because of that information, I felt like us keeping track of what we were doing in the state was a priority. Our critical care command center definitely was actually providing more reliable information at this point. Um, I, take, I took this picture at the end of my rotation in the ICU after 14 days in the COVID unit. Uh, as a director, I basically decided to stay 14 days straight in the unit because I felt like that was the right thing to do. And uh, we, we basically were able to take care of a lot of patients. We had a lot of patients that we lost and, um, and, but I think overall our outcomes were actually very good compared to most outcomes in the rest of the nation. Uh, we had a total of 10 of our best nurses that got infected through, with COVID. And despite them getting infected, they still came back after clearance. And that's something that I, I need to say my hats off to my unit. They were simply amazing. So before I finish my presentation, this is where we are. This was uh, my, uh, from our website. And we are right now, as you can see, the blue bars are going down, but we, are, we still don't have full resolution. But we started our endeavor at University Medical Center with up to 23 patients on the 22nd, 23rd. We went up to a climax of up to 1,000 patients uh, by April 5 and 6. And by the end of the rotation of my unit rotation, we, we finished with 680 patients. Right now in region one, we're down to 546 patients, but it's extremely important that we pay attention to what is happening in other regions. If you pay attention to region two, where, is where uh, Baton Rouge is, that region right now is, is going up in the amount of COVID patients and is trying to find a plateau. So the game is not over yet. I, I still believe that this data is giving us very valuable information of what is uh, going to be uh, 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 important for management of these patients. Regarding the mortality of our patients uh, in region one, you guys can see that the mortality as this, uh, described in green was actually uh, peak in early April and actually is being going down dramatically. So in conclusion, I would like to state that from this experience, the state needs to pay more attention to the development of a critical care command center. This critical command center is, will be very crucial to uh, create some kind of a state transparency on resource allocation, PPE, among many other resource allocations regarding bed utilization, bed management, and whatnot. We concluded too that the local data control was more effective and accurate than the general outside data. And it was, uh, and, and we have evidence about this and hopefully we will publish our results because I, I think that this will empower more and more our vision of creating more of a, a, a state, uh, of a critical care command center within the state. And definitely research, I believe that uh, Dave did a great talk um, about what they've been doing on trying to collaborate with every single institution and each one of these silos needs to stay in touch to, so everybody can provide the same care. 
for our patients. So just quickly, uh, during this experience, I learned so much about each one of my people working with us. I, from going to the hyperbaric chamber where they actually live, they were building hyperbaric chambers uh, to dealing with uh, how to properly uh, trick somebody uh, with, that was a COVID patient. We, uh, we did a video about that. Uh, this is me with my uh, first responders puppies. They always were with me during all my Zoom medicine meetings. And uh, as you guys can see the rest of the team, uh, COVID was not easy for anybody and it was not easy for us, but I think that uh, we, uh, as a team, we stayed together. We had our personal loss in our family during this time, but we had so much gain. We have a, we have a new baby coming to the, to the, to the whole group. Uh, I'm a grandparent to the, uh, as of a couple of days ago, and we had our, uh, one of our girls just actually, uh, what birthday was, uh, was a Zoom video birthday. So uh, we're trying to hopefully uh, adapt more and more about where we're living today, but hopefully we will get back where we were be before. So thank you so much for your uh, time. So, I think I'm next, but I don't see my slides. D, am I gonna have my slides? Yes, she's working on them. Sorry, I somehow had lost Zoom to where I couldn't access it. Hmm. Back now, one second. Ah, back up. All right, thank you, Dee. And thanks uh, to Ron for uh, give me this opportunity of uh, presenting uh, research. Um, I'm gonna start with some uh, uh, information about uh, uh, the general um, global uh, research effort against COVID-19. Uh, and then I'm gonna focus on uh, what is happening at Tulane in many areas uh, of COVID-19 research. Um, Everybody knows uh, how rapidly this pandemic has been spreading around the world, uh, starting at least in the Western world around the uh, end of January. Um, but probably the virus has been there for uh, quite some time and uh, is not, uh, um, of course, we are uh, way uh, still in the, within the weeds and uh, uh, mortality continues to accrue. Uh, this is, these are slides that were prepared just a few days ago. Um, and uh, probably information that you are aware. So I'm gonna tell you about what has been happening uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, research, but um, of course it's almost impossible to accrue data and have uh, reliable information about uh, basic uh, research. Instead, in terms of uh, clinical trials, uh, they have to be registered, and so it's possible to find the pretty accurate data. And I think that is unprecedented the, 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 how fast the, the clinical research efforts have been growing over the past, uh, uh, since January pretty much. Um, this, uh, this slide shows the, the growth and it started uh, um, January 19th with the first two trials. Uh, in the week of April 5, uh, 227 trials worldwide were registered for COVID-19. As you can see, most of these are interventional studies. Um, uh, about 40% uh, are observational, and there is a small number of also diagnostic test uh, studies. So um, very, very rapid response of the research world in terms of clinical research. And uh, um, the, uh, one of the issues is that most of these trials are still concentrated in China, into China. China has currently more than 600 uh, uh, clinical trials ongoing. 
Um, second to China are the United States with uh, currently um, approximately 130 trials. Um, when you look at the geographical distribution, however, Europe as a whole, the European community, uh, has actually more trials than, uh, than the United States, with France in particular that is running uh, almost the same number of uh, trials compared to the United States. So this is the current uh, um, uh, breakdown uh, without considering China, of course. Uh, in terms of the uh, therapies that are being tested, uh, by far uh, the most common is hydroxy hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Uh, this may change uh, because of the data that we've already shown uh, before and um, suggesting uh, toxicity and also lack of efficacy. Uh, but uh, up to about a week ago, there were 121 trials on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, uh, almost uh, 100 um, with antivirals. Very interesting the fact that uh, there are, uh, the third one is actually traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, there are 67 ongoing trials. Um, because of the time when this slide was prepared, there is no mention of uh, uh, IV Clorox or, uh, or uh, other disinfectants. Um, and as you can see, one of the issues that is, uh, that is being created by this uh, rush to find uh, treatments, um, uh, the number of uh, uh, targeted patients uh, continues to increase. So we got about 150,000 patients worldwide uh, um, enrolled for trials, uh, targeted for trials for hydroxychloroquine or antivirals. Um, you see that, that the infection point was around March 10th, um, and now there is a plateau, which is in part has to do with, uh, uh, we have been using uh, all the potential patients, and so to find patients for additional studies is gonna be um, uh, a little bit more difficult to moving forward. And finally, um, the primary endpoints uh, uh, among the clinical ones, the most, the most used is death in 196 trials. Um, of the surrogate uh, um, outcomes, uh, the one that is uh, more, most used is viral load. Uh, many trials use still uh, chest CT. Um, I think that we are going to need the moving forward uh, and more trials for recovery time, length of stay, and ventilation rather than this, uh, um, these particular uh, endpoints that have been used so far. So after uh, this, I would like to focus on what is going on at Tulane. And I have divided the studies, the, the several dozens of studies that are ongoing uh, in our institution. And uh, first, I'm going to give you some highlights, uh, three studies that I personally uh, selected uh, um, among the most uh, important uh, uh, on COVID-19. Then I'm going to uh, give you information about the virology diagnosis, animal models, epidemiology and public health, prevention and therapy, and some takeaway points. So my personal highlights are, one is very simple, is the study that uh, was published in Nature Medicine by um, Bob Gary as senior author. Um, uh, has been featured in every single media around the globe. Uh, this is the study that suggests that um, based on genetic analysis that uh, this virus was not man-made, but actually jumped from uh, bats into humans, um, to summarize. Uh, this, uh, this particular paper is the dream of any, uh, anybody who has been doing science for many years, has been uh, accessed more than 4 million times on the website and is actually the second the most access, accessed paper of its age. Um, and is actually the number one among all those published in nature. So uh, um, I'm gonna, we all give, uh, need to give a, a, a collective thank you to, to, to Bob, because this is a really, uh, was a, a critical uh, paper. Uh, the other highlight is uh, a contract for $10.3 million that was uh, given to a group of investigators at the Tulane Primate Center with the Chad Roy SPI. This is more important than a simple grant because it's a, it's a, it's a, a contract that the, uh, is going to um, select our Primate Center to be uh, the leader um, 
to be in the leading seat for uh, the testing of promising vaccines and treatment in primates to combat uh, COVID-19. Um, Chad has been also um, extensively uh, featured on a very long editorial on uh, science. And finally, um, Jay Rappaport, the director of our Primate Center, uh, uh, was invited and he accepted to serve on the preclinical therapeutics working group of the NIH to accelerate the development of safe and effective COVID-19 treatments, which is uh, arguably the most important uh, uh, team uh, being assembled by NIH uh, uh, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now let's look at virology. Um, uh, very important, the studies on viral transmission. Again, Chad Roy has been testing the ability of the virus to, uh, to survive and spread. Um, the most important experiments have been done in uh, situations of different uh, temperatures and humidity. And Chad was able to prove that the virus can stay alive for more than 16 hours, even at high levels of temperature and humidity, um, which makes us a little bit pessimistic about the possibility that the virus is going to disappear with the summer. Um, another very important study by Tony Hu's group. Uh, Tony is a, a, a national international leader on the nanoparticulate uh, platforms for uh, diagnosis and he has devised a CRISPR based test that is able to identify genetic signatures of the virus um, and uh, uh, has an incredibly high sensitivity and is able to give results in much less than an hour. Um, most importantly, the test works particularly well in blood but also works in saliva which in my opinion is gonna be the future of uh, mass uh, testing for, for this virus. Um, about uh, two weeks ago, uh, Tulane, uh, at Tulane, we started the COVID-19 biobank. Um, with this biobank, we are gonna uh, be able to, um, to, to store to, 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 uh, and to catalog uh, tissues coming from uh, um, autopsies of patients that uh, died of COVID, as well as uh, samples that we are collecting from our uh, translational and clinical studies. Um, and uh, um, we are uh, fitting specific uh, autopsy rooms with negative pressure and other various safety um, uh, protocols to make sure that we can safely open the body of uh, patients uh, uh, with COVID. And, uh, um, and uh, this is gonna be, I think, a very important resource because it's gonna allow us to distribute to investigators, not only at Tulane, but also outside of Tulane, tissues uh, to perform uh, critical investigations also in terms of therapeutics and prevention. In terms of animal models, uh, we, are, we have a group that is developing a mouse model of COVID-19. For this, we are uh, reorganizing part of the uh, JBJ building to become uh, a BSL 2 slash 3 facility. Um, the mouse model should be ready soon, but clearly the signature of all our research at uh, Tulane is the non-human primate model of SARS. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the first cohort of, uh, uh, of monkeys was inoculated with the virus. Um, and uh, now some of these primates are showing very clear uh, typical signs of disease uh, confirmed uh, uh, recently, uh, not only by radiological evidence, but also by pathological evidence and by finding the virus into their lungs. Uh, this is, uh, uh, to our knowledge, the closest model of cl clinical COVID-19 disease currently available in the world. The, chest radiogram that you see on the right is uh, uh, almost historical. This is the first um, uh, monkey that uh, uh, died of SARS. As you can see, uh, there is uh, an opacification of the entire uh, right lung, which uh, the pathologist confirmed there was a case of ARDS. And uh, um, so this, this is a model that reflects uh, with the real high fidelity, the, uh, most of the characteristics of the infection, and so it's going to become uh, particularly important for uh, the testing of uh, um, of diagnostic tests, uh, therapeutics, uh, and uh, uh, prophylactic antibodies. In terms of epidemiology of public health, a group led by Mike Hyman, 
Uh, he's doing very unique studies for the mathematical modeling of COVID-19 um, and in terms of predicting the spread and uh, understanding the, the, the mechanism of uh, transmission in uh, large populations. Um, another group is working on the persistence of the virus in the environment, in particular in wastewater. Um, uh, my personal uh, lab uh, is, um, um, uh, has been uh, um, uh, contacted by the NIH to convert one of my grants into a SARS-CoV-2 uh, transmission. I've been working for many years on the transmission of uh, viruses similar to, uh, to coronaviruses in utero from mother to fetus. So we are going, we are ready to start uh, recruiting uh, pregnant women uh, that get infected with COVID-19 and we will uh, detect the transmission to the fetus of the virus, as well as we are gonna have the ability to follow these children for several years, um, uh, probably up to four years. Um, I, it is very interesting that the NIH in this particular moment, uh, particularly the NHLBI, the Lung and Blood uh, Institute, are interested in the uh, prospective studies. It is quite clear that um, um, this virus tends to uh, have uh, chronic sequela in many patients. And so a lot of the studies that are going to be conducted in the next uh, years are going to have to deal with uh, what happens to these patients after they recover from the acute phase of, uh, of the disease. Um, uh, Tom Levista and his uh, team and uh, several other investigators in the, uh, our School of Public Health are working on the healthcare access disparities and socioeconomic determinants. Um, as you, uh, I'm sure you are aware, uh, 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 a very large percentage of the uh, deaths in our, among our uh, COVID-19 patients in uh, New Orleans and in Louisiana and also around the United States are in African-Americans. Uh, I've seen uh, um, estimates of about 70% of the deaths being in African-Americans. Uh, and so that is gonna be very important. Last but not least, we have uh, yeah, at Tulane, one of the very few uh, centers specialized in, uh, um, in uh, domestic violence and that they are actually concentrating their efforts now to uh, study domestic violence in the post-COVID society and the ways to deter that. Uh, if you are uh, watching the literature and the press from Europe, one of the biggest problems that they are dealing with is a, a, a dramatic spice, spike in uh, domestic violence um, in, uh, in, in families uh, um, uh, uh, during and after the peak of the uh, COVID pandemic. In terms of prevention and therapy, we are uh, testing at least the two important models of vaccines. One is an attenuated virus, virus vaccine and another one is an hybrid of varicella and the coronavirus. Uh, the immunogenicity and safety and efficacy are being tested currently in non-human primates. Um, in terms of antibodies, uh, one of our uh, investigators has devised um, an antibody, a, a transgenic antibody that is able to bind the, the ACE2 receptor for the virus and has the capability certainly to uh, potentially to block and neutralize the uh, attachment of the virus to its receptor. Um, we are also working, um, as, as uh, um, um, Dr. Mishat mentioned, uh, there is a, a group that has been working on the collection of serum from convalescent patients and use in therapy. Um, and uh, uh, I would like to um, uh, point out that there are literally dozens um, and dozens of pharma companies virtually on a daily basis we request, uh, we have requests for testing antivirals and vaccine in our animal models as well as in our patient population to the point that we have to come up with with uh, specific uh, ad hoc committees to review this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, these offers, these requests um, because we have been completely flooded and I think that, that is a very important um, thing for, uh, um, for Tulane. Uh, as takeaway points, um, uh, while uh, uh, most uh, uh, academic institutions are uh, uh, ramping down the research operations, Tulane went through this crisis so far, actually not without any slowdown, actually accelerating our research operations. 
Uh, indeed, uh, as of uh, uh, the late, latest uh, quarter, we are uh, on a double digit growth uh, trajectory. Um, uh, we have increased actually year over year 13% our funding. And we are, uh, this is going to most likely be um, the best year in terms of funding uh, in the history of Tulane. Um, our central role in infectious disease research and COVID-19, along with the connection to our uh, Premed Center, has the potential to move Tulane to the next level uh, among the top uh, research institutions in, the, in, in this country and in the world. Um, of course, uh, emerging uh, diseases are in the DNA of, uh, um, of Tulane, like Dr. Blanton mentioned. Tulane was actually established to, to fight uh, yellow fever. Uh, has been on the forefront in virtually every single important epidemic and pandemic, including Ebola, um, um, avian flu, and so forth. And this is literally what uh, the, 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 the area where Tulane uh, um, has, uh, has a clear uh, global uh, leadership. And uh, uh, we are working tirelessly to position ourselves to become a global leader the prevention, detection, and treatment of future emerging infectious diseases. It is totally obvious that this is not the first pandemic, it's definitely not going to be the last pandemic, and that Tulane is working very hard to create the infrastructure needed to generate a, a one-stop uh, um, infrastructure for, uh, uh, to detect the very early pandemics uh, and uh, epidemics and uh, uh, move towards uh, uh, cell biology, uh, animal models, primate models, and the clinical research into uh, the um, discovery of management and therapeutic technique uh, as fast as possible. And this is it. If uh, you want additional information about, about the research ongoing at Tulane, please uh, do not hesitate to uh, contact me, uh, either by email or uh, through my um, office phone number. I'd be more than happy to share with you um, literally dozens and dozens of uh, uh, research projects that are uh, currently ongoing, uh, uh, focusing on COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this webinar. This is an extraordinary time and unlike anything we have seen before. With that, we all know that New Orleans is a resilient city and that we have taken care of one another in the face of disasters. I've seen many examples of community resilience and, been, and they've been wonderful to see how community has been rallying around one another. Today, I will share what's happening across New Orleans, and over the course of this pre presentation, I will discuss why we must address inequities across New Orleans to improve health outcomes and achieve health equity, share concrete ways New Orleans residents and communities are responding to this pandemic, discuss ways we can prepare for the next phase of COVID-19 response and recovery, and lastly, offer a call to action. As we move forward into different phases of recovery and reopening, we need to be sure we are looking at everything from an equity lens to ensure all of our community's needs are being addressed. And we're keeping in mind people who are particularly vulnerable. We know that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted African Americans and the African American community. And there's many different layers and barriers to this that all play a role. Structural and systemic racism is a key factor. And we also have to look at access to health care, health related social needs like fair housing, access to transportation, and the ability to earn a living wage. In this response, it's also important that we address individuals' immediate needs and have cross sector collaborations. One key cross-sector collaboration I've had the opportunity to see is really in the justice system. 
families and friends of Louisiana incarcerated, the Vera Institute of Justice and Pew Charitable have all been looking at a public health approach and health equity lens when looking at the incarcerated population. Some initiatives that have been supported is really looking at how local judges, law enforcement officials, and elected officials are acting during this time period and asking for pretrial release of youth and adults who are in jail and at low risk and those who are elderly with health issues that increase their susceptibility to COVID. LPHI has also signed on to letters requesting that individuals who are incarcerated have access to proper protections like readily available access to antibacterial soap, water, and hand sanitizer. We also have to think about how we're responding to this in a mid to long term. As some of you may be aware in the media and on webinars, we've been hearing a lot about, where we've been hearing a lot of words like health disparities, health equity, inequities. They keep popping up time and time again. However, it's- Okay, I think, uh, Christy, you're back on. Are we right? Yes. You can continue. Thank you. Okay, well, um, sorry about that. This is a quote that I wanted to really bring up to, by Natalie S. Burke, who's CEO of Common Health Action, as it really does resonate when we look at health equity versus health inequity. And if we're really gonna focus on looking at things from an equity lens and achieving health equity in the future, we need to really look at our community and what that really means and it really means transforming the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age for optimal physical health, mental health, and well-being throughout all levels of society. So when you really think about the coronavirus and the testing, a prime example of inequities is when in the very beginning, testing sites were only accessible via cars and individuals had to drive up to actually seek testing. Well, now we do have walk-up and testing also available by bicycles. One of the most financially impacted groups throughout this time period has really been our cultural ambassadors, those individuals who are musicians, artists, gig workers, and hospitality workers. And I've really had the opportunity to see community rally around these individuals by providing meals, donations, looking at alternate employment operations through, through the duration of the stay at home mandate. Some individuals who have really helped out during this time period is the Red Beans Parade. They've been collecting donations to purchase meals from local restaurants to feed healthcare workers and then hiring musicians and artists to deliver them. We also have seen the New Orleans Business Alliance raise over $646,000 for gig workers. In Louisiana, Total Community Action, which is a community-based organization, has funds available for rental assistance. We've seen Xavier University Community Outreach Center really help with utilities assistance for a specific zip code. And even Beyonce donated $6 million, of which a portion of that is actually going to go toward the National Alliance on Mental Illness in New Orleans. Throughout this time period, another key issue that we see coming up time and time again is how do we really honor those individuals who have died as a result of COVID-19, especially in the midst of social distancing. Mayor Cantrell recently launched a death care task force to address proper care and burial of coronavirus victims. And the community is really being innovative on seeing how we can adapt this experience looking at live streaming, um, hosting Zoom calls for gatherings to celebrate individuals who have passed. And some people have even conducted drive-through funeral processions during this time period. Additional contributions that have occurred is from the school system. Since March 16th, New Orleans Public Schools has provided 660,000 meals in New Orleans. And they're also looking at how they can bridge this digital divide amongst students as they're learning in this new environment. We have the food pantries and banks second harvest 
has an urgent need for additional donations, but they also have a drive through food pantry in the lower ninth ward. We've seen churches really identify different ways in which they can be innovative and bring together their congregation because a lot of individuals turn a community and church as their community. So really, how can we be innovative during this time period? Some people are doing live streaming of churches. There's even churches on Facebook. Um, and then the senior citizens. We know that seniors have been hit very hard during this time period, and isolation is a major important factor that we have to consider as well. So the Council of Aging is distributing food to seniors, and young people are even partnering with seniors to see how they can provide them with stores and provide them with necessities like food and pharmacy needs. Throughout all of this is really important for us to look at employment overall. We know that the tourism and hospitality industry has been hit hard by this. And we've seen a lot of foundations step, step up to provide financial assistance to help those individuals in the hospitality and industry because they are majoring, facing major economic hardships. We've also looked at the clinical and hospital experience and just how different people are interfacing with clinics and hospitals. Some people have reported being turned away or refused, refused COVID testing. We also wanna lift up our essential workers and thank them because without them, a lot of our needs would not have been met, met throughout this time period and the stay at home mandate. That includes pharmacies, grocery stores. They've been key throughout this time period. And many of them are working without proper PPE and being exposed to coronavirus. So we really want to rally around these individuals with community and see how we can meet their needs and provide them with PPE. Also, we brought up COVID testing. Other speakers have mentioned COVID testing before. Um, and we know that Louisiana is leading the nation in COVID testing. In April 15th, mid-April of this year, there is the ability for licensed pharmacists to order FDA authorized COVID-19 laboratory tests, but we still know that there's multiple barriers that exist with tests and even testing sites. As I mentioned before, um, Xavier having a walk-up testing site wasn't implemented until April 21st. And it's important for us to really make sure that these testing sites are in communities where people are particularly vulnerable. Um, some individuals have also reported long lines during testing sites. As I mentioned before, people being turned away, possibly due to bias or not lack of symptoms, and the testing times as well. Um, the testing times may not often align or accommodate the off hours of essential workers. And lastly, the stay-at-home order in a political climate. The stay-at-home order was extended by the New Orleans mayor until May 16th, and also the governor asked the president for additional support during this and declared a public health emergency in response to COVID-19. When looking at our mid to long-term needs, it's really important for us to stand up a robust public health response. And this response should be considering how community philanthropy, government and community partners can really support these efforts and community long-term. Numerous foundations are seeing how they can assist during this time period and have devised several COVID-19 response funds from local nonprofits to national organizations. We're also looking at how do we ensure that mental well-being and physical well-being is being addressed and treated throughout this time period, um, because we know that there's a lot of stigma around mental health and mental health services. And lastly, lastly, understanding that our landscape is going to change. How do we support communities and organizations during this ever-changing time, um, be it community awareness and education? There may be mergers and acquisitions, but between different organizations that occur and the need for developing emergency planning and protocols. So as we move forward into different phases of recovery and reopening, how can we prepare for these next phases? 
these are some key points that we really need to ensure that we're keeping an eye on and focusing on. One, as I can't stress enough, is ensuring that testing is available and equitable for everyone. I think that's one key initiative to ensure that people are aware of whether or not they have COVID-19. We also want to make sure that communication messages are easily understood by communities. Um, so, for example, some of the things that I've encountered or I've seen is individuals not using protective equipment properly, um, lack of knowledge, inaccurate use of face masks, um, proper usage of disposal, disposable gloves. It's important that we all communicate this as effectively as possible to the community um, where they can understand it and it's jargon free. And as I've stated before, we also want to make sure, most importantly, that we destigmatize mental health resources and publicize that these are free and available to individuals. So I leave you with a call to action. Most importantly, and this has been reiterated time and time again through numerous news outlets, is that we really encourage individuals to stay at home and only leave for their essential needs. We haven't, the curve is flattening, we haven't flattened the curve. And also when you're out, making sure that you're using material and safeguards effectively. So be sure to physically distance, staying away at at least six feet away, wearing masks in a protective manner and properly. And most importantly, we know that a lot of people are facing isolation, social isolation. They have additional stressors. Um, unemployment has increased. Access of SNAP has increased. And this is a very difficult time for a lot of people. So it's important that you check in with your family, friends, neighbors, and really be that support system um, that individuals need during this time period. Thank you. Um, I'm Lee Ham. I'm the Dean of the School of Medicine at Tulane, and I was asked to speak about the medical aspects of the way forward and what will the future hold. Um, um, the panelists have, uh, the other panelists who have given us great perspectives, um, um, ha have informed us a lot. And um, and so I'm just going to give an overview without any slides. Uh, I didn't have a crystal ball, uh, so I can't tell you precisely. Uh, I can tell you that on the, on, on the basis of the pace of medical findings and on the pace of the response so far, some of the things that uh, look like they will occur. Uh, one, we will have uh, one or two therapies uh, in the way of antivirals uh, or other drugs uh, that are proven to be effective. Uh, the pace of uh, clinical trials, as you've seen, has been uh, unprecedented. Uh, probably if it had been half as fast as they've been, it would have still been unprecedented. Um, likely uh, within uh, a year, to 18 months, we will have at least one vaccine um, that is uh, widely available. Uh, now, that's a little bit more speculative uh, when none is at hand presently, uh, but so much testing is being done, so many possibilities are being done, and the nature of the virus is such that that is the uh, uh, what I think is the expectation. Thirdly, in terms of testing, um, we will have a variety of testing that will be widely available, uh, will be relatively inexpensive, and will be pretty accessible. Now, that's going to be after some months. We're not here, we're not there today. Uh, we won't be there in a month or two. Uh, as, you, as you know, as you've heard, there are two types of tests in general. One that tests for the virus, which has usually been the PCR test, 
but you also heard about a remarkable test under development using the CRISPR technology. Uh, but also, there wasn't much talk about the antibody test, but we clearly, in another two to three months, will have antibody tests, uh, which we know we'll know at that time a good deal about. We may not know everything that we need to know about them, uh, but we will have some knowledge of when they develop, who they develop in, um, and we'll have some hope of what they mean. But I think more importantly, in a way, is the other things that have happened in response to this pandemic. And that has been the efforts that have gone into this. I think the efforts actually have been quite remarkable across a number of fronts. Uh, you know, for instance, in the New Orleans area, um, we have only had cases for about seven weeks. And the amount of information we know, the amount of um, uh, the way that things have changed has been, um, uh, again, I'll use the phrase unprecedented. Uh, and if it had been half as much, would have been unprecedented. Um, a tremendous amount of collaboration uh, within institutions, across institutions, You've heard about that in the local community. It's actually happened nationally so that, uh, you know, uh, Boston and Philadelphia and Baltimore and New Orleans are all sharing protocols that change virtually every day. Uh, and major things have changed. Dr. Muchat emphasized how uh, anticoagulation has become important in the treatment. That's something that three weeks ago was barely on the radar screen. And now it's common knowledge. Um, and that has been true in several directions. And so I think we're treating the patients better today with better outcomes than we were before. And there's still subtleties that we will know relatively soon about those patients that did better that you couldn't tell with looking at five or 10 or even 20 patients, or you couldn't do it in the midst of this pandemic that we'll be able to determine these did better than those. But the nature of the sharing will probably be something that will carry forth. The nature of how the FDA can respond, the nature of how the pharmaceutical companies and the NIH can collaborate when pressed. The nature of how we look at the distribution of critical resources like PPE, like ventilators, I think will be changed. Just like Katrina changed how nationally what the guidelines were for communication systems after in the midst of disasters, I think this pandemic will change how we operate both during the midst of a pandemic, but also in the planning for it. But I think even more broadly than that, just like the H early days of HIV changed how we respond socially and ethically, I think that this pandemic will force us and is forcing us to look at social and societal and ethical issues we've heard all about inequities, disparities, uh, it will force some of those issues for us to more critically examine and how all of these things are interconnected and how all of us are actually interconnected and that uh, we can't talk about how things are in Baltimore or in New York without thinking about how they are in Tucson or in New Orleans, that really we are a much more interconnected world than we maybe uh, envisioned ourselves or imagined ourselves pre the pandemic. So I think we're just beginning to see 
what the effects of this pandemic will be, but I think there'll be both. Um, I think there'll be beneficial changes, not only medically, but also uh, I'm optimistic that society will respond well to, to this. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ham. Thank you, Dr. Blanton, for inviting me to this um, really esteemed panel. And thank you, Dr. Ham, for giving that 360 view. I'm going to talk a little bit way forward public health, which is not quite as sexy as the medical um, interventions, but they're really important. So I think that in, in, until we get all the medical interventions in place, uh, we'll certainly need to use these. And I, um, oops. Oh. How'd I lose that? I lost the little thing. Oh, there we go. So um, I have a crystal ball, but I don't have any answers. So what is in the future for, um, for this? So public health initiatives are really, really important. It's not a zero sum game. We will need both medical interventions and public health interventions. And the simplest thing, such as washing your hands, your mother told you to, your parents told you to do that. It's super, super important. Physical distancing, we've heard about that. Testing, and I'm gonna also talk about contact tracing. So first of all, physical distancing. Why do we do it? We all know because it's airborne. Um, most of the infection happens because of large droplets, but we've now found a smaller percentage of uh, transmission can happen with aerosolized. So just talking can happen. Certainly the, uh, the droplets that go onto surfaces can also uh, be uh, part of the um, uh, transmission. So uh, for those of you who are not from New Orleans, keep your bute homa. <laughs> That's a little sign that says, you should stay at home, stay at home. And that's what we're under right now. In, in New Orleans, we're still under that. Louisiana has lifted that a bit. But for right now, staying at home, keeping in contact with only your close uh, relatives that are the people that live in the house with you. Um, you should stay at least six feet apart. And you might ask, why six feet? Well, it's a little bit based in science and a little bit not based in science. Basically, they've done some tests and they found that people usually sneeze. It's about two meters, which is about six feet or two arms length. So when a person sneezes, the droplets usually can go that far. There are some super sneezers that can go as far as 10 feet and 20 feet. So that's why you still should maintain physical distancing whenever possible and mask as much as possible. So don't gather in large groups. It's simply the probability that you will come in contact with somebody who's infected and stay out of crowded places and avoid mass gatherings. So those are the recommendations for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and others, WHO. Why washing your hands and how to wash your hands? So you must use water, of course, soap. Uh, hot water is the best. And also they tell you to, 20 seconds is best. And the, one of the ways you can remember that is sing happy birthday twice or something like that. But it's washing your hands, cleaning under your fingernails. The simplest of things, use a dry paper towel that's clean or a dryer. Why washing your hands? Well, the COVID virus itself has a lipid protein on the outside and the soap will actually break down that lipid protein and render the virus less capable of transmitting the infection. So washing your hands after you touch surfaces or your face or anything where the, uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, would be able to um, get on your hands. The next thing is testing, testing, and more testing. So yes, we have tested a lot of people in, our, in Louisiana, but it's really only about 3.2% of the population, still very low. Uh, as you see this picture, uh, John Bell Edwards was visiting Trump, uh, President Trump. And um, as Christy said, uh, we'll be getting more testing and how that can happen. Drive-through testing, walk-up testing, testing availability is really important. Some places are uh, loosening the restriction that you have to have symptoms. We all know that uh, transmission can happen before people have symptoms. And there's, we don't know exactly how many people are asymptomatic. Could be in the 10% range. Some people are saying it's far more than that, 50% range. We don't really know until we have more, a better case of the denominator. So masks and basic hygiene are really important. This is a gentleman sneezing. Um, and as I said, some people can super sneeze. And so of course, sneezing or coughing in your arm is also gonna prevent the droplets from adhering to surfaces. By the way, surfaces, um, not all surfaces are the same. Uh, uh, cardboard and copper seem to, the virus seems to last less in a shorter period of time, but on other objects such as plastics and uh, stainless steel can last longer. 
And so uh, we don't know exactly how long, but some of the studies have shown that it can last up to uh, several hours to even uh, days on some of these surfaces. Shaking hands, we may see that shaking hands is going to be a thing of the past. Um, you know, we may instead replace that with bowing or doing something else, you know, maybe putting your hand on your heart or something like that. But shaking hands right now in this time is not a, is not a good idea. And so um, elbow pumping would be better. Don't fist pump, but elbow pump. Uh, PPE or uh, personal protective uh, uh, equipment. Uh, masks are helpful. Masks in the context of a healthcare environment, particularly if you're using Vent if you're taking care of patients that are ventilated, an N95 is absolutely needed, as are face shields and um, the whole protective gear of gloves and gowns and everything. In the general environment, uh, it is advisable to use a mask. It's not so much that it's going to, uh, these non-N95 uh, masks are not so much going to protect you from getting infected, but it will protect you. There's a certain about amount of it that will protect you, but it's also to protect others if you happen to have the virus and don't know it and pass it. So um, homemade masks, CDC said homemade masks are okay. They're not as good as an N95, but they're probably just one step down from the surgical mask that we use. It's best if it can pinch on the top of your nose so that it can more occlusively seal around your mouth. But these um, protective masks are um, also helpful. Um, and also making sure that we clean surfaces and wear gloves. Now gloves are a tricky thing because if you wear gloves and you don't change them all the time, then they're probably more likely to transmit infection. So wearing gloves in, as a one-time use or if you can then put them away and let them sit, sit for several days up to a week so, so the virus would die on them, um, that would be okay. But cleaning surfaces with um, bleach or um, a highly, um, uh, or some kind of cleanser that has a high percentage of alcohol in it is really important, particularly in high volume areas like doorknobs and places where people touch a lot. Cell phones are something people don't think about, so clean your cell phones very often. Um, there, um, I forgot to mention that with hand washing, it's actually better if you can just use soap and water. That's probably more effective. There are hand sanitizers that are available. It's sometimes hard to get them. Local um, breweries are making them, a little expensive. I saw a bottle for $10. But the homemade uh, cleansers have to have a 60% alcohol content for them to be effective. And they really are no match for just healthy soap and water with running water and soap and doing it with friction for 20 minutes. So also surveillance is gonna be really, really important. As Dr. Mushat mentioned, we went from cough, shortness of breath and temperature to adding more symptoms that are uh, not, and we continue to increase the number of symptoms, like we're now hearing about COVID toe that, um, and other things like that, loss of taste and smell, which wasn't on the list and now is. So surveillance is going to be really, really important. And as you can see here, um, uh, many of us are, are obsessively monitoring the surveillance that's going on in the state because we see, want to see where the hotspots are. And so this was from yesterday, I believe. So you can see on the um, nolaready.com, you can find out where um, hot pockets are. You can also see the census tracts that give you information on that. So surveillance will be very, very important as we continue on. Contact tracing is gonna be our, our next really important thing. It's being done. It's being done not in a um, organized manner just yet. Uh, the Office of Public Health is undertaking it, but it's, it's going to be very timely and costly. Uh, we went from shoe, what they called shoe leather epidemiologists. This is mostly in the context of infectious disease where people would knock on doors and um, they would burn holes in their shoes because they'd be traveling so much and they would go and contact people. We still do this with HIV, tuberculosis and other things, but we're now getting more sophisticated and we have to be with the volume of people that have uh, COVID-19. So uh, there are initiatives like using uh, cell phones and other things that will be helpful in making sure that um, um, contact tracing can happen. So anybody who is po found positive, anybody who's in their close contact, close circle, who has not been masked and uh, is negative should be tested. And so that we're gonna be moving into that phase, I hope in this state more, um, more so. So the Office of Public Health will be initiating that. And there are some other initiatives at um, different hospitals. 
So physical distancing, the problem is all of these things are not as great as taking a pill, right? Everybody wants to take a pill. Everybody wants to get an injection. But these are the basic tenets of basic things of public health. And they're not quite as um, interesting and as fun to do. And so people are not adhering to them. Some people, most people, 70% uh, of the community is and wants to and feels like we should continue to do that even if they lift the restrictions. But this is a, a beach in Florida where people um, did not adhere to the physical distancing. This is a party in Chicago. I'm not trying to uh, blame anyone, but this it was a party in Chicago that was found. This on the right-hand bottom is people protesting, saying, give me liberty or give me COVID. I'm not really sure that person understands <laughs> what COVID means. But, um, and then this was a, a, a Hasidic Jewish population that uh, two days ago had a funeral for a rabbi who died of COVID. And you can see some people are masked, some people are not, but certainly they're not physical distancing. So that's, that's gonna be a problem. Okay, so um, uh, just in, in summary, we should go back to our basic public health uh, properties. While not, in a, not just while we wait for uh, medications and vaccines to come, but in addition to, because these will not work uh, without, it's not a zero sum game. We need to have all interventions. So what we have is making sure hygiene, clean counters, wash hands, glove when you need to, use hand sanitizers, hand sanitizers if you cannot wash, reduce airborne exposure by masking and covering when coughing, uh, using physical distancing, so physical distancing is six feet at, at a minimum, and uh, making sure you, you sneeze into your sleeve when you can. And then, of course, test, trace, and isolate. So when we test, we find somebody positive. We should contact trace their, uh, their contacts and also isolate anybody who has been exposed. So I just want to thank you. That was a really quick little rush through, but I know we're over time, so I just want to make sure uh, the, the public health uh, initiatives that we can do right now, it's right in front of us, but even after some of these medical interventions become in place, we should still continue to listen to what grandma said or mom, mom and dad said, wash your hands, wash your hands and cover your mouth when you sneeze. Thank you. Well, uh, this is Ron Blanton again. I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, this has been very helpful, very informative for me. I, I feel more at home even now than before. One of the great things, uh, if there is one out of this epidemic, is oddly enough, I've gotten to know more of my colleagues than I ever have or would before. Uh, as has been mentioned before, there's been a great deal of sharing that's taken place between everyone, uh, not only within New Orleans, but across the country. It seems like one big family. The other thing that is important is that I've seen uh, the quality of people that we have here is just absolutely excellent. Uh, while New Orleans was not entirely prepared for uh, uh, this crisis. Uh, the response of New Orleans and the sense of an emergency, perhaps it's our experience with Katrina, has made a, a, a remarkable uh, thing to witness in terms of the ability across all platforms, across uh, different institutions for uh, people to begin to work together. And uh, it's something that we expect, as Dr. Ham mentioned, to go into the future. What we really need to look for now is that we're able to plan for these crises in the future and make it so that uh, the population itself uh, is at a state that it's in a much better condition if such a crisis should just arise again. So I want to thank you all for uh, attending this um, uh, webinar. And uh, I think uh, we'll sign off.